Welcome back, honors. Well, not welcome back, but welcome to your first flipped lesson. Welcome to your flipped classroom for the year. Of course, I'm very, very excited that I got to meet y'all yesterday. We went ahead and dove straight into the content. We started talking about like the West and defining it as a cultural idea and how it's different from what people consider the East, but that's why we call ourselves like a Western civilization, and that's why we're studying Western civilizations in general to kind of understand um, our story in this entire pantheon of human history. Now, the big thing, though, that we got into yesterday, we also talked about, like, uh, the totality of human history, right? We talked about, like, ancient human beings only taking up about 200,000 years of this 4.5 billion year old rock that we're flying through space on and stuff like that. Uh, we used the football analogy. We talked about how early humans, right, are going to start off as breaking away from apes and then create and evolve slowly over time. Uh, y'all, a lot of y'all had a lot of really, really awesome things to say. Uh, Abby Delaney asked a lot of great questions yesterday. Very impressed with y'all so far. Keep up the good work. Can't wait to get to know y'all better. But let's go ahead and jump straight into what we were talking about yesterday. So we left off talking kind of like Homo habilis, right? So like, remember, you do not need to write this. But like Australopithecus, of course, being like the oldest version of like hominid or humanoid type animals, right? And then over thousands and thousands of years, slight mutations are going to occur that are going to basically create a brand new type of person or a brand new type of animal that is going to be unseen like any other one, and so it denotes its own class, right? Homo erectus was another big one as well. He's the very first hominid to actually walk upright consistently and be completely bipedal, which means we're walking around on these bad boys, right? Our legs. And then, of course, the next one, next group anyway, are known as Homo sapiens. And that's the one that we fall into, right? So modern man falls into a group known as Homo sapiens. Now, there are other subspecies within the Homo sapiens group, like Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons. If any of y'all have ever seen this movie before... I want to see some real caveman action out there! We do this fast! We do this loud! We do this as a family! And never not be afraid! Hurrah! That's a really good example. My niece, by the way, like I said, obsessed with it, right? The Croods is a really great example because it's supposed to be like the Croods family are Neanderthals and Guy, the guy voiced by Ryan Reynolds, is supposed to be more like a Cro-Magnon, right? So Neanderthals are from the Neander Valley in Germany, and Cro-Magnons are actually believed to originate in a cave outside of uh, someplace in France, right? So there are these new types of man that start popping around, and then there was another one known as Homo sapien adults who... But we are specifically known as Homo sapiens sapiens, right? So when you're actually looking really, really into the progression of human evolution and stuff like that, you have to understand that Homo sapiens sapiens is like what we are, right? We are the most like evolved form of man. We have a fantastic brain to skull ratio. Uh, we're actually, ironically enough, a little bit smaller than both of these. Neanderthals and Cro-Magnons would be believed to be a little, a little bit larger uh, than they, we were actually. And Neanderthals might have even had larger brains, but they weren't as developed or complex, right? So Homo sapiens sapiens are the type of humans that populate the world today, right? And we have evolved from several other iterations through the past, right? And as we talked about in class, you know what I mean? That does not conflict with Catholicism at all. It's supposed to be much more the answer to um, why, and then we're now explaining the how, right? So the big thing about it, though, also, is that early human history, including all those people, including the evolutions of man, can be broken into basically two distinct periods of time, right? So when humans began to be modern and when Homo sapiens began to wander the earth and then they started grouping themselves together and basically creating family units and little structures of civilizations or base units of civilizations, they basically turned into two different eras of history. You've got the first one, which is known as the Paleolithic period, which we will talk about first. And then you have the second one, which is known as the Neolithic period, which we'll then talk about, like, which is the one we're living in now. So, Again, going back to like our cruise example, right? Uh, the Paleolithic period would be the one that they're living in, and this thing we're, li we're living in now is the Neolithic period, right? So to be more specific, though, the Paleolithic period lasted from about 2.5 million years ago to about 10,000 BC, right? So remember, modern human beings have only been around for about 200,000 years. So Homo sapiens in general have only been around for about 200,000 years. 
but our earlier relatives, our like more unevolved forms of man, had been around for much longer, right? But from about 2.5 million years ago to about 10,000 BC, uh, humans were nomadic completely, right? Completely nomadic hunters, and they were like small hunter-gather family groups, right? So nomadic, reason why I have that thing in bold right there, is if you don't know what that word means, I need you to write it down real quick. But what nomadic means is that you traveled from place to place to find your food, right? You roamed around to actually find food. You followed your prey where it went. For example, this is an image of early man taking down a mammoth, right? And we believe that that is one of the ways that man was able to survive this thing known as the Pleistocene epic. And the Pleistocene epic is what you commonly refer to as the Ice Age, right? And we apparently hunted a massive amount of these very large mega, like what are they called, megafauna, these huge mammals into extinction. Not we, I wasn't there. But like basically, the in a nutshell, like these nomadic family groups would follow their prey. Like if the mammoth moved, they would move with them, right? And so this is going to lead to a dynamic where there is this idea that men are going to be become the hunters, women are going to be the gatherers, and vice, well, not vice versa, but what's going to end up occurring is that gender division of labor, right? So men had certain jobs, women had certain jobs, but the very interesting aspect about this, though, is that it actually led to a very, very large sense of equality, right? So without women, men could not survive because they could not create medicines without them, gather certain vegetables or fruits without them, and actually sustain themselves without other, like, just no protein, or excuse me, sustain themselves outside of their protein sources without women, and women could not survive without the men for their hunting abilities and things like that. So ironically enough, nomadic hunters and gatherers are going to be the earliest form of people in Paleolithic periods, and it was actually a very equal society. And you saw the origins of things that we consider to be so human, right? I think yesterday we talked about it, um, when you all ask something about like, well, how did they communicate and stuff? Well, that's the thing is during the Paleolithic period with these family groups like this one, you saw the origins of language to pop up, right? We believe that language may have come around close to like 130,000 years ago. We're not positive because there was no way to document it because language came before writing, right? And so language probably popped up just so humans could better communicate as they were becoming more sophisticated, especially so they could communicate in large hunting parties, right? So they also created complex tools, right? Complex tools inferring as in attaching a sharp stone to a stick so you can make a spear out of it, right? Bows and arrows are going to come much later, but you understand what I'm saying? Complex tools in the sense of a tool having a purpose, creating a knife, tanning leather, making clothes, things like that, right? Religion is another really big one that's very important. We believe that religious structures actually began to pop up during the Paleolithic period because what did humans do? They started burying they're dead, right? So we believe that human beings began to practice religion in accordance with the idea that they began to bury the people that died in their family groups. This is one of the oldest burial sites that ever known in human history. It's over 30,000 years old, and it's actually a child, right? And it was found in Africa, and it's believed the idea because this body was apparently buried with a couple of small trinkets and other objects. And so if you're actually burying someone with goods, it means that you don't want their body to be destroyed by scavengers or be um, destroyed by or eaten by other types of uh, animals that come in to feast on that, like, that flesh. But the thing about it is you want it to be protected. So if you want to be protected, maybe there's a chance that's when humans start to become aware that there's, there's an expiration date on them, that they may die one day, and that also that is the birth of religion. But we believe religion and the burial of the dead go hand in hand, right? We also saw the growth of art during this time period. Cave paintings, and this, of course, being the oldest one in existence, this is in a cave in Spain. Uh, this is probably made by either Neanderthal or Cro-Magnon men, actually showing sweeping lines and movement through horses and wild game, and apparently what looks and appears to be uh, some type of wild uh, bull. Now, the big thing about it, though, is like this is early man trying to communicate things that they had seen, right? Another big thing, though, is migration, right? I need you to write this down, okay? So early man, it is believed that all men, every single human being, can trace their original origin back, possibly to a singular mother named mitochondrial Eve, right? So, uh, and we believe that this person probably existed inside of Africa, right? So, 
this is called the out of Africa theory, right? So it is believed that as humans evolved, they actually originally evolved in this sub-Sahelian area of Africa, meaning below the Sahara Desert. And then they slowly began to migrate out for better weather conditions, more following certain games and moving through different areas and finding somewhere to actually continue to follow and find food, right? And so as they began to pop around over thousands and thousands of years, this is going to change their genealogic structure, right? You're going to see uh, people's skin lighten up. You're going to see people become more adept to survive in colder areas. So you're going to see a lot of different things happen. But it is believed that all human beings originated inside of the continent of Africa. Now, interestingly enough, though, also about 5,000 years ago, or actually probably closer to 50,000 years ago, well, actually, no, about 5,000 years ago. They also, though, migrated up this way and then went across what's known as the Bering Strait and then began to get into North America and then migrated down, and that's where your Native Americans came from. And then, of course, after the Pleistocene epic, which was that ice age, that ice bridge melted away, and they were basically stranded there, and that's why you ended up with a group or populace inside of North America that this area or this hemisphere did not know existed, right? So the big thing about, though, going forward is the Neolithic period. Period, right? So I love talking about Paleolithic anthropology. I think it's very, very interesting. Um, it's something I could definitely see myself getting an advanced degree in one day if I ever had enough time. But the big thing I really enjoy talking about also is this transition between the two, right? How did you get from Paleo Old Stone Age to Neo New Stone Age? By the way, that's what these two words mean. Paleo, P-A-L-E-O, means old, and Lithic means Stone Age. So if Paleolithic, like paleontologist, means Old Stone Age or studier of old things, then Neolithic means New Stone Age, and we are living in a Neolithic era, right? 10,000 BC to the present, okay? So this is currently a part of the Neolithic period of human history. Ironically enough, the smaller of the two. Now, going into this, though, what do you think could have happened that caused this shift? We were talking about nomadic hunter-gatherer groups. We we're talking about like people migrating, creating art, doing religion, and advancing as a human race. But what could have been the thing that caused this dramatic transition from Paleolithic to Neolithic to make man so different? Sorry, somebody's getting called to the office. But what could have happened? What what, what would it have been? what would it have been? Farming. That is exactly right for whoever said it. It's very, very important. All right, Gianna, good job. Very impressed that you said that answer. Farming. How do you make nomadic man stop moving and make them what's known as sedentary? Okay, this is really, really important. Sedentary means stays in one place. How do you make ancient man stop moving around and become sedentary? You invent farming. Now, I don't mean that like we went back in time and invented farming. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, Farming was invented by man. Men continued to evolve and they continued to learn and eventually they began to realize that you can cultivate crops on your own by planting seeds and planting them in a large space, tending to these crops, and then harvesting them later on when they become fully mature, right? So farming was developed, and that's going to make people stop moving around. Now, there are huge benefits to this transformation, massive benefits. You've got animal and plant domestication, which we will talk further about when we get into class, right? We'll discuss how that works, right? How do you domesticate a plant? We'll talk all about those things. But animals, actually, we believe... Um, may or may not have been domesticated first. We might have actually domesticated, we're not positive, okay? We're not sure, sure, but either animals or plants were domesticated around the same time, within the same about 2,000 year gray period. Uh, the very first animal to be domesticated, of course, was the dog or the wolf, right? The common gray wolf was domesticated by man and turned into what you now know as a domesticated dog. And they're actually the oldest domesticated animal in the entire world. And they're actually crazy enough, out of, there's, only, there's over like 120 large mammal species that you think could be domesticated, but they can't. You can only domesticate nine of them. And trust me, humans have tried to domesticate just about all of them, right? So, but the big thing though is that domestication of plants and animals is then going to lead to surplus food systems, right? As in, oh my God, we have enough food not to feed myself, not to feed my family, but to feed an entire community and they all don't have to farm on top of it, right? We have a couple of farming families that produce enough food for everyone. So what is everyone else going to do if they're not farming? That's when job specialization came in, right? You saw people start developing crafts and becoming good at making certain things. That's known as an artisan, A-R-T-I-S-A-N, an artisan. 
That's a very important word. Write it down next to job specialization. Now, there's another thing that happens, though, is like one human community invents farming, then another one does. Then you're going to see trade occur between these two groups, and then the, eventually the development of writing. And we will talk actually in class about the very first group to develop writing. Now, there is an evolutionary biologist, though, by the name of Jared Diamond. And he has wrote this article in small book that I'm throwing a picture of up right now. And he argues that the invention of farming may have been man's worst mistake, right? So, like, as in the biggest misstep in history may have been the invention of farming. Because due to the invention of farming, man became less like its uh, Animalia counterparts in the world. And then became what we are now, this... This, this group that I can like record myself on this computer that is attached to the internet and you can watch it at your house through video, radio, and also wireless signals. That's bananas, right? But he argues that it might have been a mistake in the sense of that there were a lot of negatives that came along with it, right? So due to the invention of farming, you saw the creation of social classes, right? You started seeing this kind of like difference between people who had a lot or had X access to a lot of things and then people who did not, right? So you ended up with people who were the governing class or the wealthy class or the poorer class or the religious class, right? And how that led to people not being necessarily equal anymore. Whereas in the Paleolithic period, they were equal to one another because everyone had jobs that kept their entire community alive, right? Then also gender inequality, right? Women had their job taken from them due to farming due to the fact that they were the ones that used to go out and gather berries, fruit, Roots, things like that, other like like greens to eat, also make medicines and rear children on top of everything while men have their job. Now that men are also gathering and hunting and not even needing to hunt because they also have animals domesticated, so hunting's not necessary anymore. Women have had their roles taken from them, and now that they have a reduced role in society, they've then been pushed to the back, right? So you ended up like leading to this idea of like women having a lower status in society, okay? So the bigger thing also is poorer nutrition. You ended up having people that actually did not eat the pantheon of certain things that they're supposed to, right? We don't eat as much as we possibly can anymore. Our diets are not super widespread. They're actually much more narrow, right? We actually only eat certain things now as opposed to eating a lot, okay? The biggest one that we will also discuss inside of class is also viruses and disease, right? There are so many diseases that were not originally meant for man, right? It was not originally meant for us. We were not supposed to be able to get it. But since we were so close to all these animals and domesticating them, these viruses began to mutate that affected that animal and they began to jump to human beings, right? One that is like a very, very prominent one is the flu, right? We believe the flu might have originally come from pigs. Uh, the chicken pox, Mm. We, uh, smallpox is a massive one as well. We believe that these diseases might have actually come from the domestication of animals. And then as over time, viruses are very adept at mutating, as we know with the coronavirus right now. And they, make the bill, they get the ability to jump over to different species, right? Because we're not supposed to be surrounded by all these animals all the time, right? So, but... Let's get off the negatives for a minute. The Neolithic Revolution happened. I'm talking to you through YouTube. It is what it is, right? So that is going to, though, lead to the growth of civilizations, right? Now, the word civilization originally comes from the Latin root word for civ, right? And civ actually refers to the individual and or a person in the community, right? We see this root word in things such as uh, civis, which means citizen in Latin or civitas, which means city. And eventually that word's gonna morph into civilization. It's, a, it's an area that includes many cities, right? So a massive empire, if you will, a giant kingdom that includes a bunch of different places, right? Civilizations are going to begin to grow, we believe, around 5,000 years ago, about 5,000 years into the Neolithic Revolution because they are going to farm and create all these surpluses and they're going to create enough goods to feed an entire populace, right? So that's very, very important. And civilizations are first going to originate, ironically enough, not in lush super green, really, really great areas, they're going to actually, well, they were green at the time, but they're actually going to create themselves in arid regions, right? In arid, I mean being hot and outside of certain areas being much desert-like, right? So, but it was just nearby bodies of water. So you saw the very first civilizations popping up in the Middle East, in Egypt, in Southeast China, in Sub-Sahelian Africa. Sahelian means the Sahara Desert. You learned the ball about that in Mr. Wooderson's class. Thank you, Mr. Wooderson. Uh, like in the, Sah the Sahara Desert, Sub-Sahelian means underneath it, right? 
right? So that's in your western coast of Africa area beneath the Sahara Desert. Also, you saw the earliest civilizations growing out of Mexico as well, uh, that of course being the Aztecs. Now, also, but going into it, extracting food from these arid regions demanded a ton of cooperation to be able to tame waterways like this and use its massive benefits. So this cohesion and cooperation is gonna to lead to the growth of all these different areas and these different civilizations. And with that, you're gonna see cooperation lead to specialized jobs, government systems, and even more sophisticated religious structures, right? Now your religious structures are not gonna be what we use now typically, which is more like along the lines, their religious structure in the Neolithic period, the early Neolithic period, we're a lot of times grappling with the geologic things that are happening around them, right? Like trying to avoid floods, trying to pray for good crops, trying to sacrifice animals to gods to try and prevent certain things from happening, right? So like those though are going to grow into very sophisticated religious structures, including multiple gods and priests and a hierarchy and a bureaucracy within their religion, especially also within their government. Now also interestingly enough, we don't know which one came first, religion or government. We really have no idea. Because technically a chief of a tribe is a government and just burying a body could show signs of religion. So we have no idea which one came first. If I had to pick, I'd probably say religion came first. Like just due to the fact that like being aware of your death eventually could, could possibly lead you to religion. Now, all civilizations though share the same six characteristics, right? You know you're a civilization if you have concentration. And I don't mean you know, you're sitting there trying to think of an answer. I mean concentration as in you have a lot of people living in one place, right? You have distinct religious structure, okay? As in you have a religious structure that includes priests, sub-priests, prayer practices, things like that. You have political and military structure, right? Bureaucracy, armies, uh, you've got a leader or leaders, okay? Uh, social class systems are also a big thing about a civilization, even though they're an unfortunate side effect that, that occurs. We, they are a thing, right? They occur, they're a thing. Now, writing, though, also, or record keeping, artistic and intellectual activity is another big one as well. And then we also know that our first civilization that we're going to talk about in class is actually analyzing the civilization that you've heard of probably when you were in middle school known as Mesopotamia, right? Of course, originated out of modern-day Iraq, um, around the banks of the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. But we will begin an in-depth analysis of that area in class on Monday. So I'll see y'all then. Y'all have a good one.